engine operation Q and A, physics in the beer garden, inspired by you, whom I love in an entirely non-fag way. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au, the place where new car buyers save thousands of their next new cars. Hit me up on the website for that. First up, mean effective pressure and performance, which, speaking personally, makes me very hard indeed. Down there, every time I consider it, you name the three ways to improve specific output. The first two are self-evident. The last one, I'm a bit confused about. To increase power, you can increase engine displacement, okay, or increase mean effective pressure in the engine. Basically, in a naturally aspirated engine, that's not really possible unless you use higher energy fuels. Hence, forced induction is normally used in modern engines to increase mean effective pressure and therefore torque per unit displacement. Is it true to say that this necessarily equates to increasing engine efficiency? Perhaps you can explain. Thanks. Essentially, there are no higher energy fuels, right? So I don't exactly know what that means. You can increase compression in a gasoline engine, that's a petrol engine in Shkaya, if you use higher octane fuel, okay? High octane fuel resists auto ignition better, but it doesn't intrinsically have more energy. More compression equals greater expansion or more expansion through a greater range, which equals better engine thermal efficiency. Unfortunately, petrol slash gasoline engines are knock limited. So if you pump up the compression, you also need that higher octane fuel to resist the otherwise inevitable knock, which ultimately will destroy your engine if it gets out of control. High octane does not mean more energy. It means more knock resistance, and that is quite a common misconception. This MEP, mean effective pressure business that JK is on about, okay? Mean effective pressure, it just means how hard the combustion event is pressing on the piston, essentially. It's an engine design R&D thing. If you improve MEP, you get more performance in a nutshell. So, in addition to pumping up the compression, subject to the fuel tolerating that, you can also just control the combustion event a bit better, which is what the whole move away from carburetors to multi-point injection and then to direct injection has been all about over the past three decades or something. You get better combustion event control. Things like throttle by wire and variable valve timing, variable inlet manifolds, they all manage combustion better, delivering a higher MEP. Mean effective pressure is the second part of my B squared MEP chat, which you might have seen in my recent Lexus LC500 review. My two Bs, bastardized and brake, are essentially still just talking about the same thing. Bastardized brake mean effective pressure. The key thing there is mean effective pressure operating on the cylinder, on the piston. So basically the three ways to increase performance are to increase the volume, which you could do by increasing engine capacity or kind of by using forced induction to just sort of increase the volume, at least it increases the engine's ability to consume air. More air equals more fuel equals greater thermal efficiency in general. You can increase the engine speed as well while maintaining the torque production, that's number two, or you can make the engine more thermally efficient and improve its mean effective pressure. The third one, right, mean effective pressure, is typically a lot more expensive than the other two and it's essentially this race that all car makers are in to meet increasingly tight regulatory and fuel consumption standards. If a car comes with idle stop start that cannot be disabled, I am not buying that crap. The minute amount you saved in gasoline at idle is exceeded by the cost of wearing out your battery and starter motor. Well, yes, the batteries can be quite expensive. Just have a look at how much to replace the battery in a Mazda 3, like, ouch. 
that will certainly offset a lot of that alleged fuel saving. But I think you misunderstand how these systems work fundamentally. The battery and starter are typically not used for the restart. You know, when the engine kicks back in once the lights go green, it's typically not a battery starter motor deal. That's just a backup. What happens is the car actually stops the engine. When you stop at the lights, the engine stops fairly precisely with the cylinder, usually cylinder number one, just after top dead center on the compression stroke. So it's basically ready to go. Locked and loaded, weapons hot, whatever. All it needs is a spark. Okay, so what, it, what the engine does when you need to restart, it just fires off the spark plug in that cylinder. You know, you get a bang and the engine starts running. It is mad engine starting voodoo, at least according to Arthur C. Clarke. And the trigger to invoke that spark and restart the engine is usually the reduction in brake line pressure as you start easing off the brake when the light goes green. And that's enough to buy you some time for the restart so you're not waiting there endlessly, seemingly, for a few seconds while the engine gets its act together. And I'd have to say, these systems are brilliantly clever in that they can do that, but they are also fundamentally hateful from a user's point of view. It saves bugger all fuel, right? And it reduces emissions by roughly the same amount. And it detracts excessively from the refinement of the driving process. But there's no denying it, these systems are also very clever indeed. As a mechanic, I can relate to your physics in the beer garden. When I was an apprentice many years ago, my TAFE instructor would just about have a fit if any of us said that the air air fuel mixture was sucked into the cylinder. He said it was caused by pressure differential between the low pressure in the cylinder and atmospheric pressure. But then I guess to keep it simple, most people would understand the suction method rather than try to get their head around the physics of engine operation. So here's the big news flash there, right? Fluids, which are liquids and gases, they only ever flow in response to pressure differential. That's a difference in pressure between two points causing flow. It's always going to be from high pressure to low pressure. No pressure differential, no flow. Okay, it's the same sort of thing with heat really. There's a lot of similarities between the two. No temperature differential, no flow. So I'm kind of on board with this TAFE instructor's message in relation to what actually causes flow. The mathematics of flow very boring indeed. It's all about pressure differentials and viscosity and mass density and the conservation of energy, etc. It's never going to get you laid, okay? The full bleeding from both ears experience, and there's no escape. If you want to know how flow works, you really have to endure that pain. There's no sucking in the equations either, I note, although learning them does certainly suck, I must say. But if you scratch the surface just a little here, philosophically, in the beer garden, you quickly see that there are two ways to motivate a pressure differential and invoke flow. And they are both equally enjoyable. Blowing or sucking. I, I doubt Bernoulli or Pascal taught their classes this way. Okay, I'm just saying. I'd suggest that we need to motivate flow all the time in the modern world. Like, you open the faucet, okay, and water comes out, doesn't it? Because of a pressure differential. You use a bicycle pump, a ceiling fan, whatever. It's all about flow. Pressure differential causing flow. And you can only do this in two ways. You can only motivate this in two ways. By manufacturing a region of high pressure for flow to go from, or by manufacturing a region of low pressure for flow to go to. When you want to pump up a tyre, right, something we've all done, and something you should do once a friggin' fortnight if you know what's good for you, you manufacture a region of high pressure inside a tank using a compressor, right? Then you depress the plunger and air flows from relatively high pressure in the tank to relatively low pressure in the tire. It would be fair, I think, to call this sort of operation blowing. When the exhaust valve opens in your engine, right, and hot exhaust departs the engine through the exhaust port, it's fair to say that it is being blown out, or at least it's blowing itself out, whatever. When you use a leaf blower, 
The name's a bit of a giveaway, I'd suggest. It's manufacturing high pressure inside the unit using a fan and blowing it out of a tube towards a region of lower pressure relatively, i.e. one atmosphere, so you don't have to sweep the friggin' driveway, right? It is entirely convenient, and I guess they call it a blower for a reason. Kind of the exact opposite of a vacuum cleaner in the house, which sucks, literally and metaphorically, if you use one often enough. The engine on inlet is manufacturing a low pressure area in the cylinder, so it is definitely sucking air in, philosophically. This is just semantics, right? When high pressure motivates the flow, we call it blowing. And when low pressure motivates the flow, it's sucking. They're philosophically opposite ways of getting the same job done, invoking flow, right? Semantics like this, though, they have no effect on the mathematics of the physics of flow. The equations don't give a shit. It's all just delta P and cross-sectional area and viscosity and mass flow rate and stuff like that, and then a couple of tampons for your ears. The flow does not care, right? If it's being blown or sucked, they're both pretty good experiences, I'd have to say. Perhaps there's even a parallel friggin' universe somewhere where the atmosphere blows air into an engine and sucks exhaust from it at the other end of the process. And even though they would be different universes, the same mathematics would quantify the processes. I think one of the main reasons why teachers of this stuff refrain from using terms like suck for engines on inlet or blow for exhaust or something, apart from the obvious innuendo and the fact that we are dealing with teenage boys here, is that they just don't want any students thinking that engines are pumps. Engines are specifically not pumps. They incur pumping losses, but they're emphatically not pumps. They are sources of motive power. They got some of the same hardware as some kinds of pumps, that's for sure. They got pistons and valves and stuff like that. This is why teachers use inlet compression, ignition and exhaust over my descriptive preference for four-stroke engine operation. Suck, squeeze, bang and blow. Yes, I want that worked into my epitaph in some way. And hey, in my defence, Your Worship, I'd suggest that if they did it that way at school, more people would graduate from high school with a better appreciation of basic applied physics. There would thus be fewer creationists, fewer anti-vaxxers, not as many flat earthers, quite a few less Scientologists, Mormons and moon landing deniers, all gumming up the cognitive friggin' gene pool. Most people today get their scientific education from the Avengers movies. And you wonder why humanity seems fucked. <laughs>